Good afternoon and welcome to the MP Evans Group PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company can review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Peter Hadley chaplin Good afternoon, sir. Hello, uh, Lily. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you so much. Um, we're, this presentation follows the release of our 2023 full year results, which uh, were released to the market uh, yesterday. Um, we will, during the course of the presentation, um, uh, um, give you some background on the company, but the primary reason for this is to uh, present our results for the year. Um, if we can move to the uh, first slide. Um, many of you will be familiar with our story, but uh, we've been around a long time, uh, no less than 150 years. Uh, and indeed, we uh, celebrated that historic milestone um, last year, which uh, I uh, no doubt some of you uh, uh, here today uh, um, uh, will have attended. Uh, so it was very good to see those of you who, who did. Um, we, we are uh, a plantation company, but for the last 20 years or so, we've been focusing on the production of sustainable Indonesian palm oil. That, that is our business, business, that is what we do. And we have been growing uh, to an ex the extent that we now employ over 12 and a half thousand people um, seven of them in the UK and the rest in Indonesia. We have a, an absolutely fantastic team. Um, uh, we're very proud of our, our, our team uh, at every, every level. Uh, and we believe that is the reason we produce such excellent results because we really do have a brilliant team. Uh, and we've been growing not just in terms of employee numbers, but also in terms of our planted hectareage and last year, we were successful in adding another 10,000 hectares. We acquired another uh, 10,000 hectares to our portfolio of group-owned and group-managed uh, oil palm areas. So a significant increase to our, to, to our areas. Um, uh, you can see that our uh, various projects are spread between Sumatra and uh, East Kalimantan, uh, where we have our plantations, and indeed our six uh, crude palm oil mills. The blue dots represent our associates, a small joint venture palm oil interest uh, in uh, Sumatra, and the remnants of the, the property uh, company, which is uh, in now in its very mature stages of development in Malaysia near Penang, um, which has been around for um, 30 odd years, um, which is a former uh, Malaysian estate owned by ourselves, in which we are joint venture partners, um, which is gradually been, uh, has been developed into housing uh, shops and uh, indeed a, a, a new township, but it's in, in the closing stages of that, of that project. Um, and um, uh, we are extremely proud of our uh, environmental, our sustainability credentials, of which Matthew will uh, uh, speak um, a, a little bit more a bit later. So perhaps we can now move to the next slide. These are our four, if you like, principal strategic uh, pillars, if you like, our core values, responsibility, excellence, growth and yield, and yield in a sense of yield returns back to shareholders. Um, the, the, the primary and most important one of all is the responsibility we have um, towards all our stakeholders. Um, we have been uh, members of the RSPO, the Roundtable on uh, Sustainable Palm Oil, since the early 2000s when the RSPO was formed. Clearly, uh, we do not engage in deforestation. We clearly have a policy of zero burning. Uh, we have an excellent zero waste policy. We provide excellent housing and other community facilities, which helps towards um, uh, re retention uh, of, of staff and managers. Um, all six of our mills are, uh, are up and running and um, uh, are producing certified sustainable output. That's palm, palm oil and palm kernels. Um, 
we have recently published our uh, reports on uh, TCFD and ESTCFD task force on climate and financial related disclosures and ESG environmental social governance. Um, and we are indeed on track with our net zero targets. Um, excellence is something we strive for. We invest for the long term. We, we invest both in people and in our assets. And this helps us to deliver increasingly uh, higher yields and extra oil, that's crude palm oil extraction rates from our mills. Um, the most recent mill was opened in 2023 at the Musirawas project in South Sumatra. And we um, strive to continue to improve our, our extraction rates and our yields uh, per hectare. Um, we have strengthened depth across the company um, where we see successful transition of senior management roles. Um, our president director of our Indonesian operations, who's uh, uh, one of our directors, uh, Chandra Sakaran, um, uh, passed the baton on to uh, Pak Ravi Chandra, known as Ravi, who is doing an excellent uh, job. Uh, Chandra is still uh, working with us as a consultant as well as uh, his non-executive uh, role, but uh, we've made, uh, uh, there's been an excellent transition there and in a number of other senior management roles. So as I say, strength and, and depth across, across the organization. Uh, growth comes from three primary sources. The crops grow as the palms get older, as they, they continue to mature, we're still relatively young in terms of our average age. Um, uh, and also as with better and better agronomic practices, our yields improve. And also as we acquire new areas of land, of course, we have increased crop growth as well. So from those three sources, three different uh, um, ways uh, in which we are able to continue to grow. Uh, and indeed, this was evidenced in our record crop and uh, crude palm oil production during the course of last year. And as I mentioned earlier, we added 10,000 hectares to our group portfolio. Um, and we are continuing to plant more um, oil palms sustainably at our um, a project in South Sumatra at Musi Rawas. And coming to shareholder returns, we uh, have delivered and continue to deliver improving returns to shareholders. We have a, uh, an ambition, a program of further improvement and growth, uh, and the strategy is to deliver further increases of shareholder returns. Um, as Luke will um, uh, speak more about, we generated over 100 million, 107 million in operating cash last year. Uh, and we were able to increase our dividend, our total dividend for the year by two and a half P from two and a half pence, uh, uh, from 42 and a half to 45 P, uh, of which the final dividend payable in June has been increased from 30 P uh, to 32 and a half P. Uh, and not to be forgotten either is the earnings per share is enhanced by our ongoing program of share buybacks, we believe that buying back our own shares is an excellent uh, uh, investment at what we believe to be uh, under, under, undervalued um, uh, pricing by, by the market. I mean, the market does what it does, but we believe this represents a, a good opportunity to buy a significant value in what we know to be excellent quality uh, plantation land. Next slide. Um, just a, a snapshot or a few snapshots of uh, last year's um, celebrations marking our 150 year uh, anniversary, um, both in the UK, Mansion House, uh, where we had our AGM followed by a, a lunch, and indeed uh, in Jakarta and in other parts of Indonesia. And what was great was to see uh, 15 or more of our Indonesian colleagues uh, come over to the UK. Normally they host us, but for not once it was our chance to host a visit from them, and it was great for them to see what, what happens over here in the sort of HQ, um, and it was all, all together a, a, a great success. I think morale, um, you know, a great morale booster all, all around, uh, and it was great to have um, shareholders meet some of the Indonesian team uh, uh, as well. 
So if I may at this point pass across to Matthew, who's initially going to talk about the palm oil and the wider vegetable oil market. Great. Thank you, Peter. So um, before we get on to talking about our own operations, I think it's helpful just to set the scene and, and put it in context in terms of, uh, as Peter says, first of all, the wider vegetable oil market. And I think really the chart on the left hand side of this slide really does illustrate how much things have changed um, over the last few decades. The chart goes all the way back to 1990 and looks at what the world vegetable oil market uh, looked like then. Uh, and you can see that uh, the, the total world market at that point accounted for approximately 50 million tonnes, just over 50 million tonnes. And, and you can see the steady increase over several years since then and how the world market has increased all the way through to, to the last full year, to 2023, where the world market for vegetable oil is now over 200 million tonnes, around 220 million tonnes. And importantly, the, the, the various elements uh, of each of the bars represents the, the various vegetable oils. The, the first part, the bottom part, is, is, is in dark green, is palm. And you can see how palm has been taking steadily an, an increasing share of that increasing market over time. Uh, and when we sort of explode out the most recent year on the right-hand side of the chart to look at it in a bit more detail, and you can see that by the time you get to 2023, palm is actually taking 40% of the world vegetable oil market, certainly when you include the, the two key products that come from the one crop, because palm obviously produces crude palm oil, but it also produces palm kernel oil, the two parts coming from the same crop. And between them, they account for 40% of the world's contribution to the main vegetable oils. So a substantial part of the world's vegetable oil market. And if we then focus in a bit more on palm oil in detail and look on the next slide, I think the key thing I would take, if we could just move on to the next slide, the key thing I would take from this next slide is just how productive palm is when we compare to the other major vegetable oils. The key thing that sets palm apart from the other major vegetable oils is that palm is a permanent tree crop. All of the other major vegetable oils are annual crops. And, and, and palm is substantially more efficient in its use of land compared to the others. And when we talk about that 40% of world production, of vegetable oils. That 40% of world production is achieved from only 8% of the land area that's given over to vegetable oil production, which I think is really quite a remarkable statistic. And if you look at, as, at the right hand chart on this page, this really brings this point home. The other major vegetable oils will generally do less than a single tonne of oil per hectare of land given over to cultivation. And if you look at palm on average, if you think about all of the hectareage given over to palm oil cultivation, obviously the majority of which is in Indonesia and Malaysia, if you look at the overall average from the entire area given over to cultivation, then palm does a little bit more than three tonnes per hectare. But if you think about what we're able to achieve at MP Evans, for every hectare that we cultivate, that we, that we manage, that we harvest, then we're able to achieve more than five tonnes of oil per hectare are, uh, cultivated. So a substantial improvement on the average because of the, the agronomic practices that we deploy, because of the efficiency of the mills that we have, that we have in, within, our, within our group. And we're, you know, we're not happy with that. We're not satisfied. We want to keep working hard to improve that even further. We're, we're, we're committed to working towards pushing that up to six and beyond. We think we can do that with the, with the excellent quality of, of the hectareage that we have uh, and the investment that we've made in, in our milling facilities. 
So that just gives you a bit of a sense of, of vegetable oil and indeed you know, palm oil in, in, in particular. It's extremely for, important for us then to focus on sustainable palm oil. As it, as it said on the previous slide, only 20% of the world's veg, uh, sorry, palm oil production qualifies as certified sustainable production. Now, of course, that doesn't mean the other 80% is not sustainably produced, but it's about certified sustainable production. Everything that we do is done on the basis of sustainable production and sustainable cultivation. And this has been an area of absolute focus for us. And of course, opening another mill enables us to push forward in this area. And we're very, very pleased to be able to report that by the end of 2023, all of our mills are now certified uh, to produce sustainable output. And that will help us in our continual journey of driving up the proportion of our output that qualifies as certified sustainable output. And as Peter mentioned earlier, it's been very important to us to increase the amount of reporting that we do to enable all of our stakeholders, our shareholders, and our other important stakeholders to understand what we're doing in this area. So over the last 12 months, we've published a TCFD report. Last month, we published a new ESG report. And there's a huge amount of detail in both of those reports around the area of, of sustainability in its broadest possible context. And uh, this is obviously designed to be a financial um, update for you, so I'll, I'll try very hard not to go on about this area for too long, but I do highly commend both of those reports to you uh, as, as very valuable insights onto the work that we're doing in, in both of these areas. Um, one, one point I can't but help mention is a, around our, our, our journey on carbon reduction. Um, when we first published in this area, we set 2021 as our baseline year for measuring our what's called our carbon balance sheet, so our total carbon emissions as a group. And, and we've obviously then moved forward. And in, in the annual report we published yesterday, uh, we give detail on our 2023 position on total carbon emissions. And, and we've already, uh, having really focused in on this area, uh, achieved a 19% reduction in our total carbon emissions. A lot of that comes from the fact that we've been busy investing in, in efficient mills of our own and increasing the proportion of our crop that goes through our own efficient mills. And more, more of that in a moment in terms of operational impact, but that has a big impact for us in terms of our sustainability credentials and our ability to drive down carbon emissions. That makes a, a big difference for us. So, as I say, I'll, I'll try very hard not to dwell for too long on this area, but I do recommend both of our recent reports to you for further reading in this area. If we turn to the next slide and, and, and really start to focus in on operational metrics, um, this slide really tells the story of, of 2023. And in particular, again, the benefit of now having those six mills operational throughout the year. Over the course of 2023, we harvested 1.2 million tonnes of crop from the areas that we manage, those, those areas that we own directly and the areas that we manage on behalf of our associated scheme smallholders. And 95% of that crop was then taken to our own milling facilities to be processed. Only 5% sent to outside mills, and we're extremely proud of that statistic. We're very nearly at the position where we're harvest, where we're processing all of our own harvest, which operationally and financially is fantastic for us. Now that we have six mills, we have capacity to bring in crop from outside suppliers as well, and so that's how you get from the 1.2 million of harvested crop to the total of 1.6 million total processed crop. And then you can also see on this slide the fact that from that combination of 1.6 million tonnes of crop processed, we achieved an average of 23.4% oil extraction rate in the year, which again is, is a figure we're extremely proud of. That was up on the previous year. And given that combination crop, 
given that a quarter of our input is coming from outside suppliers where the crop quality is inevitably not quite as good as the crop that we harvest for ourselves, delivering that 23.4% average extraction rate is something we're extremely pleased with. And similarly, ending up with production of three, over 360,000 tonnes coming out of our own group mills, again, is, is a big deal for us this year. That's up more than 20% on the production coming out of group mills in, in the previous year. So real operational progress uh, in terms of what we've been able to deliver this year. So at that point... Uh, we should move on and look at some more of the detail and some of the financial consequences of all of that. Uh, and at that point, I'll, I will pass over to Luke. Oh, thanks, Matthew. <laughs> so just, just starting um, at, at the, with the top row here, uh, Matthew's just touched on the group processed um, 1.6 million tonnes of crop in the year. So that's up 7% compared to 2022. And as a result, we increased our production um, from 2022 up by 11%. As well as that increased crop being processed, <coughs> there's also a benefit there in relation to um, the opening of our new mill at Musi Rawas, and also, as Matthew's already touched on, an improvement in the extraction rate. Um, 2022 was a phenomenal year from a pricing perspective. Um, so it was, it was almost inevitable that 2023 was going to see some softening in that price environment. So the average price per tonne for uh, CPO that we received in 22 was $854, and that reduced in 2023 down to $729. So somewhat inevitable, but I think it's important to stress that at that level of $729 per tonne, that still is a very good price, um, and certainly by historical standards as well. So with that resulting price um, drop, the revenue did decrease. There was an increase in volume, but that couldn't quite offset that price reduction. Um, so we saw revenue drop from 300, sorry, 327 million down to 307 million. And then that flowed through down to our operating profit. So that price differential dropped down to operating profit. And we did still see a little bit of um, heightened uh, fertilizer costs in 2023. And we, they are moving in the right direction, and we saw that through 2023. Um, however, there's still a little bit of residual inflationary pressure on fertilizer costs in the PL in, in, in the second half of the year. And that kind of nicely leads into the cost management. So, yes, we have seen an increase in our cost per tonne, but driven, as I say, by really that fertilizer increase. Um, and we try and control what we can um, that's, that's within management's control. So managing our labor um, uh, costs and also offsetting that any inflationary pressure there, hopefully with some uh, better efficiencies to really manage that cost per ton level. So with that lower profit, um, again, on earnings per share was down um, from 108p last year to 78.1p this year. Um, but we're delighted, as Peter's already touched on, um, to be increasing our dividends for 2023 up from 42.5p to 45p, and as Peter's mentioned, an increase in that final dividend uh, of the year of 2.5p. Um, and I think then also just to touch on finally sort of how 2024 has started, um, we saw a relatively soft start to 2022 from a crop as um, there was some seasonality in, in our crop trends. But in the beginning of 2023, we've seen a really strong start, crop up, 16% compared to 2022. And we're also seeing our own crop um, growing at a higher rate than 16% increase, which is good, which means we have to buy less independent fruit, which is of, of benefit to our margins um, as, we, as we look forward. So I, I think whilst uh, that some of these areas here are focused really on the PL, I think it's also important to call out that Again, almost inevitably, some of those PL metrics were going to fall. But actually, when you look at the cash generation of the group through 2023, the, the group has continued to be incredibly cash generative. So I'll just sort of walk you through this graphic here. So on the top line, the sources line, that really just shows the sort of cash that we had available to us in 2023. So we came in 
with a large chunk of cash on the balance sheet. And if we rewind 12 months ago, we were sat here saying that the reason for that was because we had quite a few irons in the fire in terms of acquisitions. And having cash on your balance sheet and having cash readily available um, for acquisitions in Indonesia um, is a real selling point. So we had a big chunk of cash coming into the year. We then generated over $100 million from operations, $107 million of cash from operations in 2023. And that is 142% cash conversion. That's where if you take operating profit to operating cash, um, that's 142%, which is fantastic. And that's up on the 127% that we saw in 2022. And then the finally, uh, finally on, the, on the end of that top bar, we did um, acquire some new borrowings through our acquisition uh, in the back half of 2023. And we've just kind of grossed up the numbers here to sort of make the, the maths work. So then if you look at that second line, the middle line, that's, that's the uses line. That's what we did with that cash that we had available to us in 2023. And the first few bars are, um, unfortunately, some things that we can't avoid. So that's paying tax um, and also repaying the debt that we have, including interest payments. So those first three green blocks we're kind of locked in for. But then you take the next section, the red section, and this is where we have a choice in terms of allocating our capital. And what we've tried to do um, as a management team is balance that allocation between focusing on getting it right today through improving our operational excellence. So that, in, that includes um, in CapEx terms, building the right housing, building the right roads, continuing with planting. Then we look to the long-term investment. So using some of our capital to make some acquisitions, which we're delighted to have done in 2023, that really then gives us additional hectorage for future returns. And then not least, we want to give back to our shareholders. So we focused in 2023 on increasing the dividend again, and, and also, as Peter's already mentioned, continuing with our share buyback program. And um, might seem modest in terms of the amount that we're putting there, um, but again, we are chipping away at that quarter by quarter, and we announced yesterday that we're continuing that for another quarter, which will take us up to the AGM in June. And then finally, that blue box on the end, we ended the year with a gross cash uh, number of just over 39 million. And again, we're just keeping a little bit of cash on the balance sheet because we continue to assess uh, opportunities for future growth um, in Indonesia and having that cash readily available is, is something that we think is of benefit. We did finish the year um, with a small net debt position due to that new borrowing we took on and our existing borrowing that we, we had already in the balance sheet. Um, so a very modest 3% net gearing and a net debt number at the end of the year of 14.8 million. So in terms of some of those shareholder returns, just focusing on, on this slide, um, this is our track record on normal dividends. And this is something that the group is very proud of. Um, and as we've touched on, again, we've increased the dividend for 2023 to 45p um, in, in the year. And um, this is an, a track record now of over 30 years of maintaining or increasing the dividend. Um, and I say that's something we're very proud of and something that the board takes very seriously moving as we look forward as well. And I think also it's sort of even more remarkable considering it's a commodity business to be able to have that stability um, as well. And we've touched on that enhancement of EPS, that share buyback program as it continues, will continue to do um, very much that, enhance that earnings per share number. So that's an overview of some of the financials. I'm just going to pass back to Matthew for a little bit of a, a view on the outlook. Fantastic. Thank you, Luke. So I think uh, Luke's already mentioned that we've uh, made a very positive start to 2024. Uh, we've reported on where we are in the first two months of the year, so crop up in comparison to, to the same couple of months in 2023. Uh, as we look further into the future, we remain extremely positive. Um, obviously, our new acquisitions that we made in 2023 form a, a good basis for continuing crop growth, a, a, as do the, the continuing increases in yield from our existing areas. And you get a very strong and clear picture of that from, from, the, uh, from the chart that we put on, on the slide 
to illustrate that, that exact position. And of course, having made those acquisitions in, in 2023, uh, whilst they are a significant in, increase in our planted hectareage, that doesn't mean that we're not interested in looking for further opportunities to increase our planted area and, and to continue that story of ongoing growth for the group. And there are a number of areas that we're currently looking at right now. We're continuing to uh, obtain certifications um, for, for our, our mills, and particularly the mill that we opened last year secured its RSPO. It, it already had one certification, but it secured its RSPO certification last month, which is fantastic. Um, and then from a pricing perspective, um, we started the year seeing prices in the sort of mid 700s. But it's very pleasing to be able to report that just in, in, in the course of March, um, we've seen some tenders um, go above $800 per tonne. So, so both from, both from a, an output and a pricing uh, perspective, then we, then we see you know, very positive signs as we, as we sit here talking to you today. So uh, we're extremely enthusiastic as, as, as we report to you today in terms of both, both uh, crop production and price, and indeed, as you can get a sense from there, the, the longer term prospects. So that, that concludes our, our presentation uh, for today. I'll, I'll pass back just now to, to the IMC team before we then move on to questions. Peter, Matthew, Luke, thank you very much for your presentation this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab situated on the top right hand corner of your screen. Just while the company take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed by your Invested Dashboard. As you can see, we've received a number of questions throughout today's presentation. Can I ask you to read out the questions and give responses where appropriate to do so, and I'll pick up from you at the end. Thank you very much, uh, Lily. Um, I, I should um, uh, have mentioned, or I should have introduced ourselves at the beginning. Uh, many of you will be familiar with us, but um, if you haven't already worked it out, I'm, uh, uh, I'm the chairman. Uh, Matthew is uh, our chief executive and Luke is our, uh, our CFO. Um, uh, but I, I, I also perhaps should um, touch on uh, the, what was said in the announcement uh, about my own role changing, which is a shift from an executive role to that of non-executive chair. Um, my role as executive chair has been increasingly uh, waning, um, which I'm, I'm delighted, to be, be delighted to be able to uh, uh, have happen. Um, I have huge confidence in uh, the management team, both here in, in, in uh, the head office uh, and indeed uh, in Indonesia. Um, uh, and I'm looking forward to um, stepping back a little bit, um, uh, but um, uh, continuing in my role as uh, chair in a non-executive uh, capacity. And I'm not sure whether prompted by that uh, 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 part of the announcement, there was a, a question regarding uh, my own like family interest. I'm perfectly happy to answer that as to whether I'm looking to uh, sell it. Uh, and I can say categorically, no, I'm not. Um, uh, um, you know, whether, whether as chair or indeed uh, more appropriate as a shareholder, I have huge confidence in, in the company, in its future. And I can genuinely think of no better investment in terms of the um, uh, the opportunity for increased growth uh, and indeed for increased earnings and shareholder returns. I may be biased, but I genuinely believe that to be the case. Um, let me now scroll down and we can, between us, uh, perhaps uh, address the various questions, which thank you so much for submitting. Um, a, a gentleman who says he's proud to be a shareholder, thank you very much. Um, can you claim carbon credits for your plantations? Perhaps one for Matthew. Uh, yes, absolutely. So the situation at the moment is, as I said, we've been working very hard to establish what the position is with, with our carbon balance sheet. Um, and this is a continuing and evolving exercise. Uh, the next step for us in, in establishing um, the requirements and the disclosures around carbon balance sheets is, is to look more closely at 
um, a significant area that we have of unplanted conservation land. Now, interestingly, what we've done is we've followed the guidance set out in, in the TCFD's requirements for, for recording um, our carbon balance sheet. And that whole concept of um, carbon sequestration in unplanted land kind of doesn't get covered. So this would be something we'd be recording and measuring and capturing over and above what the TCFD expects you to do. But it's something we are looking at, at right now. Um, what that would do would give us a, a sort of offset of sorts, albeit slightly outside of the TCFD's expectations. So that, that's what we're doing at the moment. In terms of claiming carbon credits, um, and I think more for us, we see it as the potential to be a, um, if you like, a, a credit line on our carbon balance sheet rather than a sort of a, a carbon credit and perhaps the way you're thinking about. Um, thank you, Matthew. Um, perhaps you could take the next one as well. Uh, excluding the latest acquisitions, what percentage of our plantations will require replanting during the next three years? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, the simple answer to that is a very small part. Um, if you look at our plantations around Indonesia as a whole, um, the substantial majority of them are still very much within their first generation and won't require any noticeable replanting within the next three years. The exception to that is that our plantations in North Sumatra, our sort of mature plantations that we've had in the group for some time, in northern Sumatra, which between them account for about 10,000 hectares. And there is a, a, an ongoing program of replanting those. And you would expect that there may be over the next three years, um, something like 5%, five percent, you know, five, maybe a bit more than 5% of those might become due for replanting, so that might be about sort of 500 hectares or something like that. But guess, that gives you a flavour of the amount of routine replanting that might be expected. Thanks, Matthew. Um, perhaps this one for Luke. Um, apart from the buybacks and the strengthening, strengthening of the year-end um, sterling rate against the US dollar, is there any other reason why net assets increased less than profits after tax? Uh, yes, uh, so I, I don't necessarily want to give an accounting lesson, so I'll try and keep it simple. But um, so, so our balance sheet is in dollars. Um, our uh, currency is, is USD. Um, in terms of there, there are a number of moving parts that will move net assets, not just the profits after tax. Um, obviously, we use those profits after tax to fund other things, which will move other line items in the balance sheet. So I think I'll just leave it there um, on, on that one. So was there a second part, Peter? Um, I mean, <laughs> may, may I just add one yes. comment? I mean, the, the, the big part of the reason is that, I mean, if you look at our statement of changes in equity in yeah. the accounts, it's opening net assets plus profit minus dividends minus share buybacks equals, you know, there are other things, but fundamentally you've got to knock off the dividends and the share buybacks. Thanks. Um, we are now trading not just below fair value, but also book value. Uh, is the market wrong or are our shares an absolute bargain? Do you want to attempt that one as well, Luke? <laughs> Do you have a view on that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, and I, mean, I think, um, you know the the, the market uh, is is what it is, and I think you know we've been quite open uh, previously with the fact that we feel that um, the market at the moment is is undervaluing what we believe to have. Um, we've touched on in the past about our net asset value as well that we put in the annual report, um, and we continue to buy back our own shares as we feel that there is. Um, a, a, an element of value in them at the moment. So um, the, the market will do what the market will do, but that certainly our view is that um, it's an absolute bargain, but there's certainly there's value in the share price at the moment. Another question, is there anything to be gained by changing the company's place of incorporation, for example, to Jersey or Bermuda? Um, we don't believe so. We've got no plans 
to do that. Uh, there has sometimes been the question as to whether we should shift altogether to the likes of um, Jakarta, Singapore, KL. Um, uh, but we're very, if you like, lean and mean in Cambridge Wells um, with the excellent um, communications with our Jakarta office. Um, we believe that, um, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We've got an extremely good structure uh, in place, a very regular communication with our um, with our Indonesian office. I don't know whether you specifically, Matthew, want to comment on any uh, part of that question I, yeah, as well. I'll, I'll vote for Bermuda. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, no. No, no. Um, fine. Uh, let's just move to... Um, this is um, a little bit of more of the same. A couple more questions. Uh, we have been making modest share buybacks for some time. Is the extent of buyback hampered by the illiquidity of shares? Would a tender offer result in a buyback of shares in greater depth if this is our ultimate goal? Um, and there's a, another question. Uh, uh, I won't read it out, but it's also similarly uh, about whether we might step up our level of uh, share buybacks. Um, I, I might perhaps attempt this one. My colleagues might uh, want to add anything to it, but um, essentially we have a certain amount of capital that we can uh, deploy and that is used towards certainly shareholder returns, whether by way of dividends, um, share buybacks, and of course uh, general uh, capital spending. We still have significant uh, capex uh, in terms of um, um, ongoing capital expenditure commitments. Although we've now completed our six mil, uh, we have uh, commitments regarding the areas which need to be improved uh, on those plantations we recently acquired. Um, uh, and indeed, we continue to plant more on our existing areas and we remain open to the prospect of acquiring more hectare. And we so like to keep our powder dry with some cash. Um, so, I mean, some shareholders, um, uh, you know, believe we should be stepping up our, our share buybacks. Others aren't so keen on it. Um, we tend to uh, think just quietly nibbling away at it bit by bit. If we can, you know, buy back even 1% per year, then over time that is not insignificant in terms of its impact on EPS. Um, there are no current plans to make a larger share buyback by way of tender or any other means, um, but we wouldn't discount that in the future. We do certainly agree that our shares are undervalued at these levels, but we also want to expand. Um, uh, so there are different balls that we need uh, to, 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 to juggle. Um, in terms of the what we're permitted to do, we are permitted under the um, market abuse regulations, MAR, to buy back um, no more than 25% of the average daily volume traded over the last 20 days, but we could apply for, for dispensation of that. But as things currently stand, we uh, operate within those MAR guidelines. A anything else to add? No. Um, let us move on. Uh, Matthew, is the industry winning the narrative regarding the important role that palm oil plays versus alternatives? Whether, whether you could say winning the narrative, I'm not entirely sure, but I think the message is, is, is finding, finding some more traction, shall we say, uh, with, within uh, a number of channels. So I think that uh, we would like you know, we, we perhaps have have a, a keen ear for these things inevitably, but but I, I think there is a sense that people are becoming you know, more aware of the arguments and don't see things in quite such a uh, black and white way, if if you like. So our our view is that you know, as as you know, the whole kind of ESG sustainability question becomes at the heart and center of so many things within public discourse, that people are actually becoming a little a bit more interested in exploring arguments rather than seeing things in such a binary way. And as a result of that, then actually people will be a little bit more able to, interested and willing 
to engage in a discussion and therefore see that sustainably produced palm oil absolutely has a part to play within, you know, going back to what we were saying earlier, within a vegetable oil market in the world. Thank you. Um, this also brings in the question of share buybacks, but it, it also um, mentions the uh, latest, uh, could you kindly advise the latest NAV estimate, which is um, based on an independent valuation, and this question highlights there's a vast difference between the share price and the NAV. Uh, Luke, do you want to comment on that uh, NAV yeah, estimate? Yeah. yeah, so, so um, again, we every year we do publish um, at the back of our annual report, page 100, um, a view on that sort of NAV value. Um, and this year it was £14.59. That's actually down from last year's 14.98, but a large, um, in fact, most of that downward pressure and movement is actually in relation to exchange rate variances, converting the dollar assets back into pounds. As per the previous question, we saw a bit of strengthening in the um, sterling towards the end of the year that effectively resulted in a lower value in sterling of those assets. But um, still uh, a big gap to, um, as we've touched on, the share price that we are currently seeing. Um, Matthew, please could you expand on any further operational improvements you are looking at implementing in the near term? Uh, yes, absolutely. And I think what I would highlight there in particular is the work that we're doing on the areas that we acquired during the course of 2023 and you know, bringing in 10,000 hectares to the group, as we say, is a 20% a increase in our planted hectareage. And, and, and what we've done, of course, is we've focused very, very significantly on ensuring that we then transplant in some of our, our experienced leaders and our experienced management team into those areas to make sure that we can then bring in some of those um, group practices to the areas that we've acquired and work very hard to bring the quality and the and the yield and the output and the, and the the benefits of all the things that our teams do from our existing areas to the areas that we acquired and that's you know, one of the main reasons we we were very very keen to acquire them is to you know, grab hold of the opportunity to add value to those areas that we brought into the group so that's one of our areas of absolute priority over the course of the next year 18 months to improve the outputs that we're getting from the areas that we brought into the group and that's matthew again what is your assessment as to the likely effects of climate change on production and palm oil pricing over the next decade well, that's, <laughs> that's a very difficult question, but it's one that we're absolutely focused on at the moment. I mean, you will have seen, if you get into the detail of our annual, re annual report, that we call that out as one of, our, one of our areas that we're very much focused on monitoring. I mean, at the moment, if we talk about your very specifically climate change, um, you know, we would say that there hasn't been any significant impact on outputs, on yields, on our ability to continue what we're doing on all of our estates at the current time. But it is something that we keep a very careful watch over. Um, what we would say is that you know, oil palm fundamentally, and we've seen this through, through many you know, weather variations, not necessarily climate change variations, but certainly weather variations, the oil palm is, a, is an extremely hardy crop, an extremely hardy plant. Uh, and we believe that that stands us in very good stead, certainly in the short to medium term. And in, in the longer term, then that's something that we will have to keep a very careful watch on as we move further forward. And, and, and obviously, yeah, pricing and production will, will, will move together, of course they will. But again, that's something we continue to monitor. Um, a question from uh, someone who identifies themselves as a newer shareholder who expresses his gratitude. Thank you very much. Um, what level of net cash would the board consider adequate to support further M&A opportunities? Um, I might kick off with a, uh, a response to that. Um, I mean, clearly we, we have um, now a, a very, uh, as we always have done, an extremely healthy balance sheet with just very, very uh, modest net gearing. 
We do, though, have um, uh, cash currently of approximately uh, 40, 40, million. 40 billion or so. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we seem to have lost. Our, are, we, are we still on? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fine. Um, we found, uh, we have found that having cash to hand is extremely valuable in um, opportunities that arise uh, in terms of acquiring new heterage. Um, uh, and therefore, we, we don't always seek to reduce um, our borrowings to the bare minimum, because inevitably it then takes a while to, to raise those that debt level again. We have to be conscious, conscious of uh, um, you know, higher interest rates. Uh, but nonetheless, to have the sort of cash that we have at the moment is helpful in terms of prospects which uh, we're continuing to explore with regard to um, acquiring new areas around our existing air, our existing mills, which would be fantastically helpful, as Matthew has already uh, touched on, in terms of um, uh, increasing the utilization of our existing milling capacity. Um, so to have some some surplus cash of that sort of order, it it is kept under review against the backdrop of interest rates, um, but uh, uh, as of now, that is uh, an amount that I think we feel uh, comfortable with. Yeah, I mean, I, I think also maybe part of the question is, uh, you know, we we wouldn't necessarily be adverse to um, taking on some more debt should the sure. right opportunity exactly. be in front of us. Um, so we don't have a set level of net cash that we're sort of monitoring to to prevent us from any of those opportunities we will take a look at what's in front of us and if it's the right opportunity and that does require us to borrow um, a little bit more notwithstanding making sure that we're comfortable with the strength of our balance sheet and um, we we may consider doing that um should shareholders be concerned about attempts to make palm oil like oils i guess synthetic oils in the lab do you want to answer that, Matthew? I'm oh, very happy to, yes. I mean, obviously, we've um, kept a close um, watch on reports around um, developments in this area around synthetic oils and, as you say, oils that are made in, in a lab rather than based upon um, crops that are harvested in the field. And indeed, we've been in, in, in touch with one or two of the companies directly to, to understand the, the processes in a bit more detail. Um, I, th I think I'd make a, a couple of comments, really. Um, one goes back to the chart we looked at towards the beginning about the fact that there is a continual increase in the demand for vegetable oils and vegetable-like substances around the world. And, and that's sort of you know, set in that context. And with that in mind, really, the second comment that all of the indications are at the moment, given the sorts of facilities you need to develop to scale up any of these kind of operations. Our understanding is that a lot of these things are very much at a conceptual stage at the moment. And even when they do, if, if they can scale up, then the ambition is to deal with operations that start to produce may, maybe tens, maybe, maybe hundreds of thousands of tons uh, of the equivalent products per annum. And as I say, that's within a context of a vegetable oil market, um, which is 200 plus million tons uh, per annum. So you know, whilst this may have an, a small part to play within a growing market, I don't think we're feeling um, unduly under threat as things stand. Thank you, Matthew. Um, we might make this our last uh, question. Um, what is your relationship with your major shareholder? Bearing in mind they also operate palm oil plantations. So that was a, a reference to our major shareholder, uh, KLK, Kuala Lumpur Kipong. Um, uh, we have an excellent relationship with them. Um, they're extremely supportive of what we're doing, uh, of our strategy going forward. Uh, I think they enjoy the dividends. Um, but it's extremely useful, as you, uh, I think, allude to, uh, the, the, uh, the fact that they are also in the plantation world and we happily compare notes uh, with one another. Um, their representative on the board, um, the Yuan, is uh, an extremely um, 
useful and helpful uh, and sympathetic uh, a contributor to board discussions. Um, we've very much benefited from having his um, uh, having him uh, serve alongside us on on the board. So it's an extremely positive and good relationship. So we might uh, we might wrap up at that point, but uh, um, uh, I'll, I'll pass back to IMC before making any any uh, final comments. Peter, Matthew, Luke, thank you for answering all those questions you can from investors. And of course, the company can review all questions submitted today and we'll publish those responses on the InvestMeet company platform. Just before redirecting investors to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to the company, Peter, could I please just ask you for a few closing comments? Uh, yes, well, thank you, Lillian. Thank you uh, to IMC again for hosting this for us. We do find this an extremely useful forum for uh, being able to speak to shareholders and would-be shareholders. And thank you all very much for uh, tuning in and indeed for so many uh, uh, questions which we've uh, enjoyed and the variety of them which we've enjoyed uh, uh, addressing and we hope we did so re reasonably uh, adequately. Um, but feel free to be in touch further if they weren't adequately addressed. Um, uh, and uh, 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 amongst the, the shareholders amongst you, um, we very much hope to see you at our annual general meeting. The, our annual report is incidentally on our website uh, and in it you will find details of our AGM, which is uh, 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 sadly not at Mansion House this year. That was a special occasion last year, but nonetheless back at uh, uh, the Tarot Chandler's Hall, where we've um, had our, our AGMs for many years. Um, uh, it's at 12 noon on Friday, 14th of June. So we very much hope we will see those shareholders amongst you uh, there. Uh, and thank you again for joining us uh, today. Peter, Matthew, Luke, thank you for updating investors today. Can I please ask investors not to close this session and shall now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of MP Evans Group PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all.